Thank you guys so much. You can be seated. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, turn to the book of James with me, the book of James and chapter number two. And we're going to look at verses one through seven. They did a great job leading us in worship this morning. We had to make a little shift in gears this week. Uh, Mr. Noah back there in the sound booth, uh, make sure you go by and, and give him a little pat on the head. He's, uh, he's slightly concussed. He decided that it would be a good idea to hit somebody who pulled out in front of him this week. And uh, so we thought we would let him lead worship concussed. And, uh, and after that got over with and we had a few laughs, then we decided that we'd let him have this week off. But uh, y'all did a great job leading us in worship. And uh, we look forward to Noah being back with us next week. And uh, uh, although his car will not be back with us next week, that little thing, I mean, that thing folded like a pancake. Uh, uh, that was uh, something to behold. But uh, we're glad you're doing well. James chapter 2, verses 1 down to verse number 7. Going to speak on the subject matter of the wisdom of impartiality and the foolishness of partiality. And uh, if you're unfamiliar with what we mean by partiality, we'll uh, define that as we go along this morning. But the wisdom of impartiality and the foolishness of partiality, James chapter 2, verses 1 down to verse number 7. James writes, My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Verse 2. For a man, if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, uh, uh, and say to him, you sit here in a good place while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Verse 5. Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are, there not, are they not the ones who blasphemy the honorable name by which you were called? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this morning and for the opportunity to sing praise and worship, to be led in worship by these wonderful fine folks today. We pray now as we open your word that you'd speak to us in truth, that you'd speak to us with authority and clarity. Would your spirit have liberty to move upon our hearts and minds as your word is open? before us. May we receive the word as it is given, as you speak it, and may, we, uh, may it find fertile soil in our hearts that it might spring forth life and that we might be a new people this week as we go out and do our business. Father, we pray that you would help us to be the missionaries that you've called us to be wherever that might be this week in whatever ministry settings you've called us to. In Jesus' precious name and all God's people said... Amen. James chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. We've been doing this series in the book of James, and it's all about wisdom for a dumb world. Wisdom for a dumb world. Do you ever feel like we're living in a dumb world? I mean, it just seems like uh, logic has uh, left uh, and wisdom has followed suit in a, in a different uh, but similar uh, trajectory. It just seems like uh, we're living in a time and an age where ignorance runs rampant. And I use that term not to be, uh, uh, to, uh, be offensive, but literally to speak of those who just don't understand or don't know. Uh, just seems like we need wisdom because we are in this dumb world. Am I right about that, church? Uh, this past week, I was uh, doing what many uh, hunters are doing, and, uh, and that is I decided I was going to hang a, a deer stand at the last minute. And I wanted specifically to hang a two-man stand that my son and I could sit in. And by the way, we're missing a lot of the Orange Army today, and we're thankful for them and praying the, for God's blessing upon them, that they will not see any deer today, and that those of us who are faithful will uh, have the biggest buck in the woods walk in front of us as soon as we get out of church. Amen? I mean, as soon as we get out of our car and into the woods when we get out of church. But anyway... Um, so anyway, so I was going to hang this deer stand and I found this old two-man ladder stand in the garage that I had never opened up. It was in its box and uh, I thought, I'll put it together. And so I did what every good husband does, Chuck. I pulled everything out, dusted it off lightly, laid it in the living room floor and I pulled out all the pieces and I laid them, strung them out across the floor, which Miss Kelly had just vacuumed. So she greatly appreciated uh, a lot. And, uh, and then I took the box and kind of shoved it over to the side and I began the task of putting the stand together. Now I've done this a 
I don't know, uh, uh, probably 10, 12 times or something like that. So uh, I did what every self-respecting man does. I threw the directions away and began the task at hand. Now, uh, can you relate with me, men? And I started putting this together and about an hour and a half later, nothing was working. Uh, nothing was hopping into the place. I mean, it, it, it should just be so simple. A few bolts here, a few screws there. Uh, let's just switch it to the pulpit microphone. A few, few, few screws and bolts here and there and, uh, and everything should work together uh, uh, perfectly, right? So after two hours, uh, maybe two and a half hours, things still were not working. And my bride did what every bride does, and she offered her assistance. Uh, amen? For all the ladies in the house, say, you're with me this morning? You're with me. All right. So anyway, so she offered her assistance, and she explained to me that if I would just simply back up and use the directions, everything would be fine. Everything would be okay. I explained to her in some very theological terms that that was not what uh, onward Christian soldiers do, that we press before us and we get this thing done. After three and a half hours uh, with other tools that uh, I did not even know that I owned, uh, uh, pieces of steel bending in places I'm not sure they're supposed to bend, uh, I decided it was time for all of us to go to bed. And, uh, and we would resume the task tomorrow. So we all went to bed and I got up the next day and look, took one look at it. And I said, I'm going to go to work for a while and I'll do it when I come home. Now, I have never believed in the Big Bang Theory, men. Uh, I have believed that the cosmos were created by an intelligent designer, namely God himself. And uh, I have never believed that out of chaos, uh, order, uh, and intentionality came into existence. But the most amazing thing happened. I came home from work about two o'clock in the afternoon and that stand was all put together. It's like order came out of all that chaos. And so I looked at it and I thought, man, that is amazing. This is a magical stand. I wonder where I bought this one. So my precious bride came in and she explained to me that it had not happened quite like that, although I wish it had happened like that. She explained to me that she had dug the instructions out of the garbage can and had decided whether to try to put it together herself, and in a matter of roughly about 30 minutes, everything was put together. Now... For the record, I do not trust the stability of that stand. I'm not sure if she really put all the bolts and screws in uh, because uh, she did update my life insurance policy shortly thereafter. But, but her point with me was that if I would just follow the instruction manual, life would go easier. It would be more blessed. There would be less hollering and screaming. There would be less uh, turmoil, less chaos. Beloved, we live in a world that is full of chaos, don't we? We live in a world that is full of turmoil. We live, in a nutshell, in a dumb world. James, the book of James stands as the instruction manual to the believer, not on how to have faith, but how to express that faith, to how to live out that faith. He does not want to proclaim to us a salvation that is accomplished by any moral action on our part, but rather what he wants to show us is that because of our faith in Jesus Christ, there are moral actions that should follow, and when we live that way, life is not as chaotic. That's the book of James in a nutshell. And this week, we turn to the wisdom of impartiality or the foolishness, if you were to put it in the negative sense, the foolishness of partiality. What do we mean by those terms and what do, uh, does James mean by that? Well, in simple terms, the word that he uses for partiality means a distinction that is made, a distinction that is made between two groups of people based on something, uh, based on some distinction that you and I have categorized in our own hearts and minds. So the subject matter before us is the wisdom of not drawing distinctions between us and someone else or others and ourselves and the foolishness of trying to draw those distinctions. We live in a time where this is a message that is so desperately needed for our world. In our churches, not, I, I could speak about our society all day long, but in our churches, we are all about drawing distinctions, are we not? 
We have rock churches, we have black churches, we have white churches, we have American churches, we have cowboy churches. We do not yet have a church for the deer hunter, but I'm thinking about planting one this time next year. We have churches where we are constantly drawing distinctions between groups of people. We are drawing distinctions, separating people, drawing these artificial boundaries upon which we expect to live our lives. This is no way to live. That's James's message to us this morning. His message to us this morning is that the church of God is about the business of abolishing those distinctions, abolishing those boundaries, abolishing those things that oftentimes separate us and make us drawn into categories. And by way of doing that, he uses the illustration of a rich man and a poor man coming into church, into the assembly, on the same occasion. Now, in order to get to the truth of his message this morning, what I want to do is I want to break his message down, these first seven verses, into three parts, and then we'll try to draw out an invitation that we can apply, hopefully, to our lives. I want to begin this morning first with what James is not doing. When you read those rhetorical questions in verses 6 and 7... It is difficult to read his words properly, and it has led many to interpret James as though he were pitting two classes of people against one another, the rich versus the poor. Notice those rhetorical questions in verses 6 and 7 where he says, are not the rich ones who, are they not the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blasphemy the honorable name by which you are called? When you read those two rhetorical questions, it's difficult not to come to the conclusion that James is wanting to start a class warfare battle here. That there are those who have and those who have not, and that those who have are inherently evil and those that have not are inherently righteous. In fact, nothing in our world would love more than for us to interpret those words in that way this morning. Because indeed, that's, we've got entire political systems built upon this philosophy. That those who have are and somehow inherently less righteous or more evil than those who have not. And then likewise, we've gone to the other extreme in some denominations where those who have are inherently more righteous than those who have not. When you read those two questions, you could misunderstand what James is trying to get to. You could interpret them as though James has some low view of those who have wealth in our assembly this morning. But such an interpretation is a problem. And the reason it's a problem is because it's in direct contradiction to the central premise of his message. I told you that his message was that we should not draw distinctions. That we should not draw boundaries. That you and I should not show partiality. That we should not judge people with certain distinctions. So for James to turn around and say that those who have wealth are inherently more evil than those who do not, or in the converse, those who do not are inherently more righteous than those who do, would be for him to himself be showing partiality in which he is arguing against. Instead, what we should do to understand his words most properly this morning is we should understand them in the context in which they were written. And the first thing we know about the early church is that undeniably, the gospel did spread at fastest among the poor. I don't know if you can understand this perfectly, but those of you who have been to India have seen this on a firsthand basis. Oftentimes in underdeveloped societies, what happens is the poor become the forgotten people, the forgotten men and women and children of a world. They're the outcasts. They are even in some circles viewed as the curse, that they are those whom God has turned his back against. This was the setting of the early church. And so Jesus is quite remarkable in the gospel narrative because he comes along and he abolishes these standards, doesn't he? He comes in and he begins welcoming the poor to him. He begins sitting down and eating with people that others thought, that the religious elite thought that was improper. But it wasn't limited just to the poor. It was also to those who were fairly rich. You may remember a man by the name of Zacchaeus who had a great amount of wealth and Jesus sat with him as well. You see, to view this as some sort of class warfare would be problematic because Jesus was after those who were the outcasts, the forgotten, the poor, those who were set aside. And therefore, his message resonated quite well with the poor in his day. 
And so undeniably in church history, the gospel did spread its fastest among the poor. There's no doubting that. And that's the context of James' writing. But a second part of James's context that we must understand is that, remember that I've said over and over again, he's writing to the persecuted church. And who was doing this persecution in this church? Well, the simple answer is it was the elite, it was the rulers, it was those who had power in James's day. They were trying to stamp out the Christian faith. And those who were in power, those who were elite, guess what? They had with it a certain amount of wealth as well. And so James, in some ways, is very specific when he's saying to them, are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the very name upon which you have rested your faith? So James, in his statement, isn't making a general one about those who have wealth. He's making a particular one about those in this church that are forsaking or uh, are persecuting these blessed believers. A third aspect to the context we must understand, and it was true then and is still true today, is the words of Jesus. And that is that he said it was easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than it was for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, that's not because rich people are inherently less righteous or more evil than poor people. What it does is it speaks to a reality that we must come to terms with. And I think the American church must come to terms with this because we don't really know what real poverty is here in the United States of America. Listen, if you go to India with us sometime, you will see what real poverty looks like. The poorest people in America live like, would live like the richest there in India. But all that being said, wealth brings with it an inherent disadvantage to the receipt of the gospel. You say, what do you mean by that, preacher? Well, what I mean by that is what Jesus was meaning, and that is that if you have a lot, there is a natural inclination that is great to be dependent upon what you have or to be dependent upon self more so than if you have nothing at all. That's, I think, what, at the heart of what Jesus was trying to say. He wasn't saying that rich people were in some way uh, uh, more inherently grotesque or evil than poor people. He was simply alluding to the reality that when you have everything you need, you don't look up, right? In the words of Tony Evans, the great preacher from Texas. When we get to the end of ourselves, when we have nothing, there's something that is inherently easier about looking for a source outside of yourself. So that is the context in which James is writing. He's not trying to start this class warfare between the rich and the poor. In fact, really quite the opposite. He's trying to have a church where the rich and the poor can coexist in harmony and worship the same Savior. He's not starting a class warfare. And to interpret his words as such would be problematic and they would be even contradictory to the theme of his message. One commentator rightly has noted, and I think it's best to do this this morning, that we must view James's words from his greatest teacher, Jesus himself, who said in Matthew chapter 5 on the Sermon on the Mount, that blessed are the poor, for they shall inherit the earth. James was echoing the sentiment of Jesus, that when you have nothing in this life, you are blessed because you turn to Christ, your bankrupt. James is not building a society within the Christian community where the poor and the rich are to be pitted against one another. Instead, in fact, what he's trying to do is show how the gospel breaks down those barriers. In fact, I would argue this morning that both the rich and the impoverished played fundamental roles in Christian history. And if you don't believe me, you can Google these things and research them for yourselves. But as James writes these words, he's addressing a church that is probably being blessed by rich believers. You say, how do you know that? Well, church historians tell us that the early church was dependent upon the generosity of wealthy people who had trusted in Jesus Christ. You say, why were they dependent? Because they had nowhere else to meet. It was wealthy people who opened up their homes large enough for the early church to come and to gather and to worship on Lord's Days like we gather today. Not only that, but through the testimony of the Apostle Paul, it was through wealthy believers in Christ that funded missionary journeys so that the gospel could be spread from here unto the ends of the earth. Likewise, poor people provided much of the momentum and much of the excitement, and they brought in much of the people uh, from the highways and the byways to use the expression of Jesus. And so as you look at church history, 
It was both the rich and the poor, that those who had committed themselves to Jesus Christ, that both played fundamental roles in the sovereign plan of God, in the advancement of the kingdom of God through the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So to misinterpret James' words would be very problematic. In fact, what they would do is they would lead us maybe even to certain political bends that would argue that uh, perhaps a form of socialism would be a utopian answer for the church's ails and the the, the ails of our American society, when none of that is at the heart of James's argument. James doesn't want to pit wealthy people against impoverished people. He wants them to worship together, being bought by the same precious blood spilt by the same precious Savior, Jesus Christ. That leads to the second truth this morning, and that is, what is James doing exactly? Well, he's proclaiming a community that is not bound by social, racial, or heritage, or any other distinction. So if what James is not doing is starting class warfare, what he is doing is he's breaking down barriers. There's no doubt this morning as we sit here in 2020, that this is a message that needs to be proclaimed loud and clear from our churches. It needs to be proclaimed loud and clear from Cornerstone Baptist Church in Sedalia, Missouri. Old wounds which should have healed a long time ago have been brought back to the forefront of our American society, have they not? We've seen cities burned down, businesses lost, homes destroyed. We've seen people left with nothing at all because we have not understood and the church has not properly proclaimed the message of impartiality found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Further, Christian and non-Christian alike, beloved, all of us, believers and non-believers, all understand and agree that partiality or the act of making a judgment based on a characteristic or trait that we all agree, believer and unbeliever alike, that we all agree that such partiality is inherently immoral. Here's what I mean. The problem in our society is not that we disagree that partiality is a problem. It is that we disagree on what the solution to partiality is. You might put it in terms like this. What about racism? What about class warfare? What about political bents that would drive wedges between individuals and people? What about drawing distinctions by heritage or by other types of things? What about even the issue of life itself? Are some lives worthy of our protection more than others? Both Christians and non-Christians alike agree that that it is immoral to draw a distinction and to say that one life has more value than another, and yet we disagree on how to approach this very subject. For example, if you've been watching the news over the past several months, you undoubtedly heard for the very first time a term known as critical race theory. I'm going to be brief this morning because I know that this can be confusing, but critical race theory basically is born from a Marxist worldview, and it rests upon three legs this morning. Three legs hold up its stool. The first is that every system designed by man is inherently evil and rigged against those who do not have for those who do have. It's what they call the hegemony problem. In other words, basically every government, every system, every institution has been designed by those who are in power for them to keep power and to oppress those who are out of power. That's the first leg of the critical race theory stool. The second is, and it, that, is, it, it, that is this, that simply being born into the ruling class or the hegemony means that I have intrinsic advantage over others even if I do not recognize those advantages or biases. The second leg of the stool is that Because these power structures exist, you and I, when we are born, are born into those power structures, even if we don't realize it, and therefore we oppress, even if we don't think we are oppressing. Just stop and think about the foolishness of that for a moment. But that is where such statements are born out of, from coming from uh, from certain uh, individuals that they are racist, and you ask them, well, well, what have you done that's racist? And they can't have an answer, but they're racist because, listen, they were born white. They were born to a heterosexual family who was not divorced. Therefore, they had the top of the tier in advantage. Third leg of the stool on critical race theory is the best way to overcome the system. A persecution is through a forceful upending of the system and by forfeiture of my own perceived advantage. In other words, this morning, if I have described you... If you were born white into a heterosexual family union 
and that, that your parents were not divorced and you are the top of the totem pole, the best thing you can do is quit your job and live an impoverished lifestyle because you are oppressing others by your simple birth. Now here's the problem with critical race theory at least as I see it this morning. First, what it does is it creates a new system in which there are oppressors and oppressed. It just reverses the roles. In other words, one of the problems with this structure or this approach to our society, to our problems, is all it does is it replaces one system with another. It says that those who are oppressed now become the oppressors and I should become the oppressed. Second, it judges a person by their ethnicity, heritage, and upbringing. In other words, instead of looking at an individual and saying, you are a racist because you're a part of white supremacy groups and you, in, and you do racist things, what it does is it looks at a person and says, you are racist simply because you are born with a certain skin tone. Third, it fails to deal with the real issue of partiality. Why do we have these divides in our society? Well, we know, church, what the answer to that question is. It's a sinful heart. You see, racism comes in all different shapes and sizes this morning. Partiality comes in all different shapes and sizes, every different color. It comes in various forms. It comes in various socioeconomic statuses. Partiality is a problem for all of us. Partiality is a problem because of a sinful condition that we were born with known as our sinful nature. What James is trying to do here in James chapter 2, which was radical then and would be radical now, is the proclaiming of a kingdom, namely Christ's kingdom, in which the normal boundaries of society are abolished and broken down. That those things that normally separate us, those things which normally would divide and conquer us, are now abolished so that we are able to freely worship in one place. James uses an illustration that we can all relate to. If you're still with me, say amen. In verses 2 to 4, he uses an illustration of a rich man walking into the congregation. And he says that this rich man... He's wearing fine linens and he's wearing a gold ring. If I was to put that in the 21st century, I'd say that he was wearing an Under Armour sweatshirt and uh, lucky jeans, right? And he walks in and everybody goes, oh, wow, look at that fella. Isn't he good looking? He must have some money. And at the same time, someone else walks in who's poorly dressed. I mean, maybe picture Brandon Wallace this morning. Are you back there in the back? Look at that guy waving. Picture Brandon Wallace walking through, right? And they said, man, he got his clothes from J.C. Penney. He must not have anything at all. That was just a joke. We, the Guffey shop at J.C. Penney. Um, so anyway, so they look, at, they look at him and they say, you know, he doesn't have anything. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to give the poor man the best seat, or the rich man the best seat in the house in a Baptist church. That would be the back row. And then we're going to make Brandon Wallace come all the way up here to the front row. And he will sit at our feet. Now, before anybody says we have never witnessed such hypocrisy, right? Just to be clear, we have done this in our own homes. We invite guests over to our house and we say, you come and sit here. And we look at somebody else and we say, you come and sit here, right? Mostly in the Guffey home, we put our kids at the end of the table. They are not a part of the hegemony. They are a part of the oppressed, right? He lays out the scenario playing out in the church. Here's the problem with the scenario. Namely, in verse 4, they have made distinctions. Notice the problem is not that a wealthy fellow walked into church. Nor is the problem that a poor fellow walked into church. The problem is that they made distinctions, verse 4, that they made those distinctions by judging with evil thoughts. And based on those evil thoughts, they then carried out an evil action. Verse 6, you have dishonored the poor man. The problem wasn't that a wealthy man walked in, nor that a poor man walked in, that they were in the same building. The problem was in the reaction, the people just even noticing, noticing that one was wealthy and the other was not, in that noticing, judged with their hearts in an evil way, made a distinction and dishonored one man and honored another based on their own uh, ideology inside. The problem with all of that is that that is antithetical to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if I didn't have you agreeing with me, you should agree with me on that point. Because, beloved, this morning the gospel does not make distinctions. Did you know that? (laughs) It is offered freely to all. The gospel judges not with evil condition, but with purity. 
The gospel says that we are all lost and undone and that we are all in need of salvation. Whether you're the rich man or the poor man, the gospel says that Jesus is your answer, right? Whether you spend a lifetime in a quote-unquote power structure family, whether you've spent a lifetime in a good home, or whether you've spent a lifetime in substance abuse and problems, the same gospel is proclaimed to both. So therefore, when we draw distinctions, when we make distinctions, when we divide people, when we characterize, when we put them in boxes, what we are doing is the exact opposite of what the gospel does. The gospel doesn't get preached one way to rich people and a different way to poor people. The gospel doesn't get preached one way to black people and another way to white people. The gospel doesn't get preached one way to the incarcerated and a different way to the free. The gospel is proclaimed the same without distinction. And when we draw those distinctions, we are acting in complete contradiction to the very message that Jesus gave. There's an important distinction that I want to draw here in this moment. I want to be clear. While I said this was radical for James's day and is still radical today, I want to be clear that James is not inventing a new system in this moment. He's not inventing a new community structure for the people to live in. What he's actually doing is the opposite. He's what he's doing is he's proclaiming the outworking of what of the gospel itself. In other words, beloved, impartiality is supposed to be a natural outflow of the gospel's work within the Christian community. It's supposed to come naturally to us. And beloved, the church has always seen this. This is why the church has led the way in adoption. And we need to get back to that. This is why the church has led the way in missions. This is why the church has led the way in generosity. This is why the church has led the way in going and proclaiming hope to the hopeless and and freedom to the incarcerated because the church has understood that the gospel is a chain-breaking work within the Christian community, within the Christian himself, that the gospel sets us free. And that impartiality begins as a natural outflow. It is natural for me to look at people who are completely different and welcome them into our fellowship. That leads us to a third and final truth this morning, which is the most important. In the course of the discussion, James lays out both the root cause of partiality and the only source for its healing. And I want to draw that out for us. The problem with worldly approaches to partiality, such as critical race theory, the problem with worldly approaches to racism, class warfare, and the like, is what they do is they require an individual to make a judgment this morning. They require an individual to make a judgment. And that judgment is to be based upon his own heart. It's to be based upon his own mind. And we know in the Christian community that the mind and the heart, listen, are plagued by the sinful nature. The Christian community then experiences something radically different today. And that's what James' message is to us. That we should experience impartiality because of the outward flow of an inward change. The source of partiality, the reason racism exists today... The reason that that class warfare exists today, the reason why people are divided into groups, and it is so subtle how even news organizations do this to us, don't they? We have our suburbans, we have our educated, we have our non-educated. They divide us into all of these groups. The reason that we are so divided, the reason partiality is shown, according to James, is because of one word, sin, our own sinful condition. Verse number three, if you pay attention. That's very interesting how he constructs the statement. And if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing. He's not saying you wouldn't notice when somebody came in. Listen, anytime someone comes and visits Cornerstone Baptist Church, and we are glad to have visitors with us here this morning, but anytime somebody comes and visits us wearing a three-piece suit, we know they don't belong. Amen? Like something has gone wrong. They, we want them to belong, but they, we look up and we go, wait a second, something's not like the rest. Most of our folks uh, are wearing jeans or they're wearing uh, something like that. or They're wearing a nice button-up shirt, but that's about as far as we go, right? He doesn't say if you notice somebody comes in wearing these things. He says if you pay attention. In other words, they saw it 
And then they had a deliberate, intentional act of making it an issue. Verse number four, you have made distinctions. You have drawn the lines. Verse four again, you have made these distinctions because they have become judges with evil thoughts. They drew the lines based on sinful behavior. From the way I notice what a person is wearing to the thought process that takes captive my mind to the expression of giving preference to one over another, each of these, James is pointing out to us, are born out of a sinful condition that we are all plagued with. Therefore, if that is the source of partiality, if the reason racism, class warfare, and the like exist in our world today is sin, then beloved, there can only be one source of healing. Am I right? Verse number one. Show no partiality, listen to these words, as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Quickly, James calls Jesus two things. First, he calls him the Lord, which speaks of his authority. And second, he calls him Christ, his anointed Messiahship. Then he lays out the strongest of deity terms and he calls him the Lord of glory. James says, because of God, because God became flesh, dwelt among us, Jesus Christ, Lord and Master and anointed Messiah. Our shedding of partiality, beloved, is the produce of our holding the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. It's only done through faith in the gospel. And if James is right, and we believe that he is this morning, then there are three inescapable truths about that. Number one, it means that only the gospel can heal the wounds of partiality. Racism, ethnic wars, class warfare, and the more, only the gospel is their cure. You want to get rid of racism in the United States of America? You want to get rid of racism across the globe? The answer is not more programs and more education. The answer is not catchy slogans or catchy 30-second commercials. The answer is the gospel of Jesus Christ. You want to get rid of class warfare? You want to get rid of ethnic wars across the globe? The answer is not convincing a people they shouldn't shoot one another. The answer is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what James is pointing to in this moment. The only way you solve partiality is by showing the impartiality of the gospel by holding fast to Jesus Christ. Listen, when I hold fast to Jesus, I have no room to push against a brother or sister who looks differently than I do. Second, inescapable truth is that only the Christian community can model this. Did you know that every system set up by the world is doomed for failure? And because every system is set up for failure, because it's set up by man, that only the Christian community will model this. Notice I said will model this, not should model this. Church, if we are not modeling impartiality, then we are not holding fast to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We should have people that are different than us. Look around. In this room today, we have doctors, business owners, employees, custodians, maintenance people, educators, teachers, and even you let the preacher in this Sunday, right? We are all different. We are very different. Some educated with, uh, with bachelor's degrees, master's degrees, doctor's degrees. Uh, others educated with high school degrees. Others educated with less than a junior high education. We are all very different. We are all one big mess. Turn to the person to your left and say, I can see what he's talking about. Inside the Christian community, however, we're supposed to model impartiality. We're supposed to say to the people around us that it doesn't matter if you look like me, talk like me, have an accent like me, or act like me, that we are united. Third inescapable truth, and this one is the most fundamental and most important. Because somebody's going to say, well, you know, we agree with you, preacher. We need to just come together and all be one. And then there could be this uh, this leading for what we'll call ecumenicalism. Because every system of man is doomed for failure, because healing is inextricably linked to Jesus' pronouncement that he is the alone is the way, the truth, and the life, this unity, therefore, must come not at the sacrifice of truth, but listen, but built upon the foundation of a single truth, that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. Beloved, when we call for unity, when we call for impartiality, it is not a statement to say, hey, you know, Just come as you are and stay that way for the rest of your life. 
It is not a statement to say that we should not call people unto repentance. It is not a statement to say that we should not have a standard of truth, namely God's precious word. What it is is actually the opposite. It is the belief that only through unity in the foundational truth that Jesus Christ alone is the way, the truth, and the life can this unity be achieved. So, with all of that said this morning, my invitation is to divest our community of any prejudice and partiality. Here's what I mean by that. Our community, Cornerstone Baptist Church, you as an individual member, attender of Cornerstone Baptist Church, we have to divest ourselves of any prejudice and partiality. We have to stop use letting, allowing our sinful nature to speak out in our lives. We have to hold fast to the gospel to which we have been called. We have to not be like the rest of the world. We must not see people in the divisive terms that the rest of the world sees them. The church is not new to the discussion of racism. Isn't it amazing how a news channel can have a host or host a panel discussion, and immediately the one person who's thrown out of the discussion is the person of faith. Beloved, the church is not new to the discussion of racism. Indeed, it is the church who has long held the answer to this evil. We want to see racism come to an end. The church must proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. The church is not a community of partiality, but a community of impartiality. The church is to be a welcoming place, a place where people are accepted and invited despite their many differences. Let me say it like this, the church in its present form, Cornerstone Baptist Church. We are supposed to reflect the eternal church. We're supposed to look like what will be gathered on that final day before the Lamb of God Himself. And what will be gathered on that day is a church that is absent any partiality shown one to over another because the eternal church, beloved, is composed of people from every tribe, every nation, every tongue, every economic and socioeconomic status, and every ethnic heritage. When we get to heaven, we will, with the famed hymn writer John Newton, be surprised at who is there. We will see people from every different walk of life gathered because the gospel did not discriminate. And neither should we. When we show partiality, what we really do, beloved, is we expose our own shortcomings in holding fast to the gospel. When we show partiality, when we draw distinctions, what we do is we show a part of us that has not yet been redeemed or brought under submission to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. In simple terms this morning, my challenge to you, my invitation, James's challenge to you, would be to find the wisdom and not drawing the distinctions that others draw. That is that on your way out the door this morning to say hello to somebody who looks a lot different than you look. To welcome them. To invite somebody this week that looks a lot different than you look. To notice that person in your school that nobody else talks to. That nobody else spends time with. And to go sit down and have a conversation with them. That is to be willing to spend our time, our energy, and our resources Not drawing distinctions, but rather blowing those distinctions into the eternal fires of hell themselves because of the gospel's chain-breaking power. Beloved, let's be a people who do not show partiality. That's where the chaos comes to its end. That's where true wisdom is found.